Prior to the Savior's visitation in America, if you recall what we've been studying and reading, is even before the earthquakes and the fires and the floods, we had political unrest, wars and contentions. Uh, they had the election where even though that the righteous were uh, voted for the righteous leader, that those that lost were trying to overthrow all of that. So, And then we had all the destruction that came with the fires and the earthquakes and the whirlwinds and the, all that destruction. If you go to 3rd Nephi 11, just to start to give a little background of what's going to happen in chapters 12 through 16, in 3rd Nephi 11 verse 1 tells us that the multitude is gathering in the land bountiful at the temple. So if you, in your mind, I have a picture of the temple here with us. We're gathered around the temple and the Savior uh, shows up and teaches them. That's really the background in here. Uh, also, in 11 verse 2, we know that there's a conversation coming. Uh, they're conversing before the Savior shows up. Verse 7, the Father introduces. Verse 10, the Savior speaks to them. And then, remember, we go back and forth, starting in chapter 11, verse 20, the Lord is speaking to Nephi, who's the prophet. Verse 22, he calls 12 to serve, and so forth. And then in verse 28, this is eleven twenty-eight. This, I think, is interesting, and I think it really gives some context to what's going on here in this week's reading. In chapter 11, verse 28, it says, And according as I have commanded you, thus shall ye baptize, and there shall be no disputations among you, as there have hitherto been. Neither shall there be disputations among you concerning the points of my doctrine, as there have hitherto been. The Savior is pointing out very clearly to these people that you have been arguing, disputing doctrines and contending about these things, and he doesn't want it anymore. So with that, let's go to chapter 12 now, this week's reading. Chapter 12, take a note here in verse 1. And it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words unto Nephi, and to those who had been called, now the number of them who had been called and received power and authority to baptize was twelve. And behold, he stretched forth his hand unto the multitude and cried unto them, Okay, so remember, he's talked to the multitude, then he spoke with just Nephi, and then the twelve, and now he's turning to the multitude, everybody, and notice what he says to the multitude. Blessed are ye, if ye shall give heed unto the words of these twelve whom I have chosen from among you, to minister unto you, and to be your servants. And unto them I have given power, that they may baptize you with water. And after that you are baptized with water, behold, I baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Now, notice some doctrine in here. There's a pattern that the Lord follows here. He calls men to hold the priesthood to administer ordinances. But the relationship with the Savior is one-on-one. -on -one. It's personal. You don't need an apostle or priesthood to have that relationship. These people had a personal relationship with the Savior. But you do need priesthood holders to administer the ordinances, to baptize you, for example. But notice, they baptize you, but it's the Lord who says, I will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. So some wonderful things in here that are really important. Again, if you listen to the chosen apostles and prophets by the Lord, you'll be blessed. So here we have in chapter 12 a Sermon on the Mount type message, similar to that found in Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and so forth. So also in here are the laws of Christ. Again, if you recall that in the children of Israel were living in Egypt under bondage, 
the Lord took them out of Egypt and he was going to give them the higher law, the celestial law or the law of Christ. But they weren't ready for it. So to help prepare them, he gave them the law of Moses. So we see three distinct levels of law. Law of Egypt, law of the world, law of the jungle, whatever you want to call it. There are laws there, but there's a higher law, the law of Moses, or a terrestrial law, telestial, terrestrial, and then the law of Christ, which is the celestial law. What we are seeing here is the Savior taking them from a terrestrial law that they were living and challenging them to live a higher or a Christ-like law. So we can take a look at a few of these laws uh, just to uh, illustrate this. For example, if you go to verse 21, this is 3 Nephi 12, verse 21. Ye have heard that it has been said of, by them of old time, that, and it is also written before you, that thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment of God. So again, the telestial law is you go ahead and kill when you want to. For example, a tiger kills an animal when he's hungry. The law of Moses says, thou shalt not kill. Don't kill. As long as you don't kill, you're on a higher level, right? Now, we're not talking about self-defense. We're talking about murder and cold blood. But notice what the Savior says in verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of his judgment. So, again, kill when you need to. Thou shalt not kill. Don't even be angry. That's the law of Christ. It's the higher law. It's the telestial law or celestial law versus the terrestrial or the telestial law. So, and there's lots of examples in here that the Savior gives. For example, verse 27, Behold, it is written by them of old time, that thou shalt not commit adultery. So again, the telestial law down here says it's okay to have a sexual relationship if you want to with anyone you want to. That's the world's philosophy right now, right? Well, as long as you want to, as long as it's entertainment, as long as it's consensual, then the, the law of Moses says, no, when you're married, you don't have any sexual relationships with anybody except your husband or your wife, whom you were legally lawfully married to. But here, the Savior's going to take it to the next level. Verse 28, but I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart. So again, there's your three degrees. Which level of law are we willing to learn uh, to live? That's the law where we need to strive for, because that's the kingdom where we will be comfortable with. So let me show you another verse here that will help explain this. So if you will go to the Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, we will go to verse 22, which says, For he who is not able to abide the law of a celestial kingdom cannot abide a celestial glory. Well, likewise, the next verse, And he who cannot abide the law of a terrestrial kingdom cannot abide a terrestrial glory. And in verse 24, And he who cannot abide the law of a telestial kingdom cannot abide a terrestrial glory. In other words, which kingdom are we going to live? Well, we kind of make that choice by choosing which law we're going to obey. Oh, I can't live that law. It's too high. Okay, then you can live a lower law, and that's where you will be, and you'll be happy with that. Now, granted, we live in a, a fallen world right now, and we have the influences around us that are so negative. But we can choose and strive. I like that word in the New Temple Recommend Questions. Strive to live that higher law. For example... Do you think there's really going to be angry people in the celestial kingdom? No. But if my heart is full of anger, then I'm not going to live there. I, I won't be there. That'll be a terrestrial kingdom for me because then I, as long as I'm not killing people, I don't want to kill people. I just want to be angry with them. Well, likewise, the law of chastity. Do you think there will be anybody violating the law of chastity in the celestial kingdom? No. 
there won't even be people who are lustful, unrighteous lust, right, in the social kingdom. Why? Because if that's what's in my heart and that's the law I've chosen to live, I won't be there. So I have three degrees of law, and I choose which glory I will receive based upon which law I choose to live. So there's a little bit of uh, a doctrinal teaching in there that the Savior's going. I hope that's helpful and enjoyable to study. Chapter 13, now go to 3 Nephi 13. In here, the Lord is going to teach the, his people how to worship. And he's going to teach them three ways. So while you read this, notice verse 1 is all about alms. In other words, giving to help poor people and others. Your donations, your tithing, your fast offerings, and so forth. All starting with verse 1. That's one way to worship. If I'm not contributing that way, I'm really not fully worshiping the Lord. Verse 5, I worship through prayer. And he gives a, a pattern of uh, a proper way to pray. Not a memorized prayer, but an example in there. And then verse 16, fasting. How do you fast? How is that a form of worship? So again, this chapter is a great chapter to review. How am I worshiping? Am I giving alms? How are my prayers? And how is my fasting? Three ways to worship. Now, if you'll go to chapter 13, verse 25, this is important. It says, And now it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words, in other words, he's now done talking to people how to worship, he looked upon the twelve whom he had chosen and said unto them, he's now talking to a completely different group, not the group, but now just to the twelve. And in this one, there's that great discussion about take no thought for your life, uh, no raiment and so forth. Because uh, I have heard some people say, oh, I don't have to worry about food storage or savings because the scriptures teach that the Lord will provide for me like the lilies of the field. I, I want to caution. He's not talking to you. In that case, he's talking to his apostles. They shouldn't care. Why? Well, think of Elisha. If Elisha needs food, how is he going to get it? Well, the ravens will bring it to him. Or the widow will bring it to him. How, or Elijah, sorry. How am I going to uh, receive uh food and raiment through difficult times. Well, our prophets and apostles have made it very clear. Self-reliance, food storage, save, prepare, prepare for those times. Apostles don't need to. Why? Well, because if Elder Bednar knocked on my door and said, I'm an apostle of the Lord, I need, uh, I need support from you, he's got it. Come on in, Elder Bednar, everything that's in my house is yours, including my last meal. Uh, I would give him. That's the pattern of the scriptures. So there's a little bit of uh, context in there that might help us understand that doctrine that's in there. Let's go to chapter 14 for a moment now. Verse 1, And now it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words, he turned again to the multitude. Again, you've got to pay attention who he's talking to because it does make a difference. So now he's turning to everybody else, and then he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, judge not that ye be not judged. Remember, he's talking about final judgment. Don't condemn people. Jesus never even condemned people when he was on the earth. And sometimes we feel like we have the right to do that. However, there is a righteous judgment that we must do. I mean, if one of my uh, teenage daughters shows up at a house with a guy with a van who... Uh, has a parole officer with him and he might not look like he should take my daughter out on a date, am I going to cast judgment? Uh, it will not be a final judgment, but I will cast a judgment that he's not going on date with my daughter in the van because the parole officer said it would be okay. So you'll notice there are times when we need to make judgments. But obviously what the Savior's talking about here is a final judgment. We're judging somebody's eternal character for uh, their salvation. Uh, not going to do that. I love that conversation in there. You could have some fun with that one too. Verse 13, uh, just a little context with verse 13. It says, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, which leadeth to destruction. 
and many there be who go in their act. Uh, I want to make sure you, you've got the spelling of straight correctly. S-T-R-A-I-T. That's not straight like a line is straight. That's straight meaning narrow like the Strait of Magellan or the many of the ocean straits, right? Where there's a narrow passageway. So verse 13 and 14 are just redundant. But he does that on purpose. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way. Well, it's the same thing. The gate and the pathway, they're both narrow. You have you. It's not broad that anybody doing anything can get in. It's narrow. It's straight. The Lord has made it very clear. Who has the authority to baptize and what commandments you have to be living and keeping to follow him, to show your love for him, to have entrance into his kingdom. Just a note of that. Let's also do verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come into you, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. How do you know if a prophet's true or false? It's pretty simple. The Lord shows us this in this chapter. How do we know what the apostles are? He pulled them aside. He declared who they were publicly in front of everybody. Likewise, we do the same thing at every general conference, every state conference, and every ward conference. The names of the apostles are read out loud so everyone knew who, knows who they are. So anybody who's not on that list, we know, is not a prophet of the Lord who has the keys and the authority of the kingdom of God. There's no surprise. It's not like, you know what, Bob was an apostle and we, uh, you didn't know it. No, everybody knows because we have the opportunity to sustain them. So I love that. So anything you read online or hear in the news and they're testifying or declaring things that are the secrets of the mysteries of the world, you have a pretty good idea that if you didn't sustain them in conference, they might just be a false prophet. Careful with that. Okay, let's go to chapter 15 now. Chapter 15. Again, verse 1 says that he's talking to his, he's, let me read it. And now it came to pass that when Jesus had ended these sayings, he cast his eyes round about to the multitude and said unto them. Again, just want to make sure you're paying attention here that uh, we're talking to the multitude, to the whole multitude here. And that's chapter 15. Old things had passed away, and he's talking about the law of Moses. Again, that lesser law we're now doing away with. It's fulfilled. Now, verse 11, 15, 11, he says, I'm now going to talk. Let's see here. Chapter 15, verse 11. And now it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words, he said unto those 12 whom he had chosen. Again, we're now switching groups there. So when he gives the discussion about the other sheep, again, he's talking to the 12 here, which I think is interesting. Chapter 16, he even says in verse 1 that there are other sheep not in Jerusalem and not here. There's still other sheep out there. Some great things. So what we're going to do is we're going to end there because this is the beginning of the Savior's teaching basic doctrine, both to his apostles and to the general congregation. But next week, we're going to look at chapters 17, 18, and 19, where he is going to give some amazing blessings and uh, share some really great things. I hope to see you next week.